Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Jamie Almansa, Executive Director of Bay Area Community Services, Charlotte Myers, CEO of Community Council in Dallas, Texas, and Portia Roberson, President and CEO of Focus Hope in Detroit, Michigan. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions through the Q&A functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. It's so wonderful that, that we're all here from different parts of the country. We have the Bay Area, uh, of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area uh, represented, uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, Detroit represented. We all are working in different communities, serving different people, but in many respects, we have the same types of problems in each of those communities. Let's go around the table. Jamie, starting with you, and then moving on to, to Charla and Portia, and, and just give us a, a sense of the scope of your work on behalf of, of your communities. Sure, and thank you so much. Good morning to everyone. My name is Jamie Almanza, and I run an organization called Bay Area Community Services. We've been around since 1953, and we are here, and our mission is to serve the unhoused community and the community that struggles with behavioral health issues. And so those two, of course, many times go hand in hand. And we run a continuum of care from street outreach to respite services, navigation centers, our main goal is to permanently end homelessness for each individual and family we serve. Um, we also run the behavioral health system of care. So everything from crisis residentials, we really are about trying to avoid the institutionalization of our community members with what, everything we do. And, and part and parcel of this is to provide both the housing piece, which is an infrastructure piece, but also supportive services. And those supportive services can unfold for families, for uh, women with dependent children, for adults, for elders. Um, Charlotte, could you talk a little bit about your version of, of these types of services? Sure, thanks so much for having me here. I'm Charlotte Myers, I'm CEO of Community Council of Greater Dallas. Um, Jamie, like your organization, we're about 80 years old and have evolved over time. Um, we serve really the most vulnerable members of our community. We have three main programs, one that serves senior citizens, uh, one that serves low-income people, and then we have um, the Dallas area 211 service, which is an information and referral. So we, we connect people with resources um, from everything from food to shelter to medical care um, in, in our communities. Portia, how are things in Detroit? Things are interesting in Detroit, and, and it's interesting to be on a, a panel with these esteemed guests. I'm the youngster on the block because we've only been around about 52 years right now, and so uh, <laughs> I don't usually get a chance to say that. Usually I'm the, uh, the senior on the block. Um, Focus Hope was started in 1968 after the Detroit Rebellion, so really out of the same sort of incidents that are happening right now around the country. Um, it was started by a Catholic priest, Father Cunningham, and a suburban housewife, Eleanor Jositis, who moved back into the city of Detroit um, to really try to rebuild the neighborhood around where the rebellion had happened. And we now provide workforce training for adults, usually between the ages of 18 and 30. We have a Head Start and an early Head Start program. And we also feed 41,000 seniors per month. So we have a large organization. Obviously, all of that is wrapped up in advocacy, race, race, and social justice. So that's what we're doing here in Detroit. And obviously, with the pandemic, as well as with the social issues that are going on right now, we've been in, in the middle of all of those. And for those of us who serve the inner cities of this country, um, one of the things that, that is, is not spoken about enough is that the people that we serve don't necessarily look like all of America. It's a part of America. Could you uh, each talk about the, the communities that you serve and the demographics of those communities and the economic circumstances? Let's, let's uh, start with Sharla, then go to Portia, and, and, uh, and then Jamie. Sharla, uh, you want to give a first cut in, in, in Dallas? What are, what are your demographics like? So especially with our workforce development programs, we've seen that the economic downturn disproportionately affects people of color. And we have definitely 
we've definitely seen that in the demographics of our clients. What has been um, particularly eye-opening for me since I've only been in this position since February is that our clients are also, other than our senior clients who we serve, they're relatively young. And that's, that's been, um, while I'm, I'm thankful that we're able to help them, it's been a little bit disheartening to me to see how many young people have been unable to find employment, who have needed, have had um, shelter issues, are having food issues. It's, it's, really, um, it's really been kind of surprising. And Portia, are, are you finding that a lot of a lot of young people are are coming into your uh, facilities now? And, we, and are, we were already definitely in our workforce training aspect. We were seeing lots of young people, people who had graduated from high school or maybe had not finished high school, who just really had, um, as I like to say, no real shot at the American dream. were not being employed or were underemployed for a series of years, and then decided to come back and get some additional training. Um, when we do our food program for seniors, we serve four counties. So actually we serve Oakland, Macomb, Wayne, and um, Washtenaw County, which won't mean a lot to those of you who are not in Detroit, but they are the surrounding counties of Wayne County where Detroit sits. And so we actually serve a wide range of people. What has been, I guess, a little bit more startling to me is that certainly with the COVID pandemic and the layoffs that resulted from that, is that we saw a lot of people who traditionally did not need our help, really need our help. And so it really points out the fact that people are really, their, their lifeline to sort of food and, and, and training and jobs and all of those things are really very tenuous. And the moment that something like a pandemic or anything hits, they need the help as well. So we've seen that quite a bit. And Jamie, I see you, uh, you nodding. Uh, are you seeing people who you never thought you'd see? Absolutely. We run a uh, homeless prevention program and our cities and counties have been very generous as have the philanthropic sector to infuse funds into the community for people who had jobs, had security and are now calling us in the numbers of the thousands to get rental assistance, assistance with food and, and the story time and time is, you know, I've been working 15 years and I've all of a sudden been stripped away from my livelihood. And so we've been able to step in mainly with rental assistance. Our goal is to ensure that we don't increase the homeless epidemic that we have here in the greater Bay Area. In terms of our demographics, we've always served about 80% of people who identify as Black or African American. I think it's really important that our staffs reflect the same. And so about 80% of our staff that we employ are people from the community that also are represented in the Black African American demographic. Um, our population is the ex most extreme of, of poverty. So people that we serve are living on zero income, general assistance, which here is $336 a month, or social security. And so that's where the housing crisis is just preeminent in terms of affordability. One of the things that, that strikes me is, the, is there is this whole question that is coming to the fore of systemic racism, systemic disparities based in race and in the history of this country, uh, four centuries of, of our existence um, as a land has um, had so many instances, uh, whether it is the treatment of uh, Native Americans, the uh, treatment of uh, Africans who were kidnapped and brought over and enslaved, um, or the treatment of uh, people coming south of the border, we just see these systems. The thing that is interesting to me is how do we recognize the system? When we, when we look at the evidence here of poverty, who do we constantly see? And is that not evidence of the systems, the systemic in systemic racism, that we see the same people over and over again, whether they're young coming in or whether they're old, being in these, these need groups? Um, Portia, how do, you, how do you see this whole issue of systemic racism and how do you use uh, Focus Hope to create a system solution to a systems problem? 
Yeah, I think there's no question that we see, you know, a historical systemic racism problem that presents itself over and over again in many different ways. And I think one of the things that's happening right now around the country is that people are saying you need to dismantle the entire system in order to build a system that works for everyone. And that's not something we traditionally have done. We've sort of, in some ways, put band-aids on problems. And then, you know, when, when an issue or an, or an action arises again, then people tend to take notice again. I really think for Focus Help, one of the ways, you know, we, we, our mission is about practical and intelligent action to fight these kind of things. And so we really want to address it in ways that we give people the kind of, um, I guess, without belittling it, stepping stones into getting to be an active participant in, in, again, the American dream. So workforce training is one of our biggest areas. And we really believe that getting people into jobs. But of course, now we're in a place where 40 million people are out of work right now, right? So how much more difficult is it going to be? And are we going to see people who traditionally already had problems getting in the workforce having more difficulty getting in the workforce? So it's an ever-changing issue in terms of what needs do we address first to try to get people um, sort of around those barriers that are presented by systemic racism? And then also, what is the challenge of an organization like Focus Hope to go after and try to fight on a larger level some of that systemic racism? One of the things we're doing um, right now is looking at and working with Wayne State University, a university um, in Detroit that is talking about the school to prison pipeline and how do we dismantle that so that that is no longer something that traditionally has characterized young children of color into this prison system by punishing them at the school level um, very severely. Jamie, do you feel that, that as part of uh, uh, Portia's point, right, if, if dismantling the system, is, isn't part of this that we separate um, economic activity, income, um, into sort of this, this category of business? And then we have these uh, individuals who are in need, who are supplied with services and supplied with support. And there seems to be a separation. Isn't it really a, a matter of, of all of us needing to become involved in the lives of all of us as, as a community? That we together, if, if I am employed and I'm safe and I can work remotely and I can have all this access to technology, isn't my problem the, the people who don't have what I have? Absolutely. I think you hit it on the head. As an organization, we too are in four counties here at Bay Area Community Services, and I spend half of my work braiding together different systems and different funds to be able to serve the person in front of me. And that bureaucracy that is just so laden with the systemic kind of stuff that we're talking about is the start of the problem. I've been contemplating for a long time whether the system can be repaired or whether the system has to be blown up. I think a simple example, when COVID first started, I had 10 staff pulled over by the police departments in their corners of the community trying to go to work as an essential service to where staff asked me for a note that they could put in the glove box to, to get to and from work. You know, that is so systemic, just because, like you said, of what people look like. I think from a community perspective, there are so many different decision makers. And the decision makers, whether it's the decision makers of the institutional jail system or the behavioral health system or who holds the actual key to housing someone, we must come together and we must kind of get out of our own way and, and identify the privilege. With COVID, another example, most of our clients don't have phones or cell plans. And so as a provider of healthcare services, it's not good enough to just say someone will get telehealth services. If you're living in an encampment, you know, you can't just turn on your computer or phone to access telehealth. So even that is a barrier and a privilege that I think we have to really look at deep, deep and hard. And, and even the issue of, uh, of language, you know, uh, Charlotte, if I, if I look at uh, Dallas, Dallas is such a business city, right? And, and it, it's such a, a city of communities. Uh, but we also have, just as in Detroit, just as in the San Francisco Bay Area, these divisions where the communities don't interact. How are you dealing with this whole idea of bringing people together and just sort of discussing how do you make Dallas stronger by actually uh, moving across these divisions and collaborating uh, through an organization like yours? 
Yeah, you know, it's a real challenge here. I'm not going to lie to you. Dallas is um, and has historically been, um, a, as it's been called by several people, a tale of two cities. Um, we have our northern part that is that is the primarily wealthy side of town. And then in our southern and eastern and to some degree now western two sectors, um, there's a lot of poverty and a lot of need. And I think the most important thing for us is education because it's so easy in Dallas for people of means to insulate themselves from people of, who ha have needs and they never see them. And it's it out of sight, out of mind, I think. for And so it's, I think, I, we feel like it's really, really important for us to, and the way we can do it is through our workforce development program, we can reach out to employers and really educate them on what's happening in our, in our Southern sectors and in our um, low income areas of town and really help them to understand that they can be part of the solution. Um, but it's a challenge here, I'm not gonna lie, it is. Well, and it's a challenge to us all because we're going to have a strong country. We cannot be leaving so much of our capital, our human capital, our people, that intelligence uh, on, uh, in a place where they can't contribute. Portia, you were going to say something? Yeah, Mark, I was just smiling a little bit because it's so, you know, you mentioned this beforehand that, you know, here we are in very different parts of the, uh, of the country and we all have the, exactly same, the exact same issues. I mean, I'm nodding my head every time Jamie and Charlotte say something because I'm like, yep, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's what we are all living with. And I think, you know, one of the things I, I definitely know on the social action side that has inspired me a bit is that when I watch a lot of these protests, I see a lot of younger people coming together who don't necessarily look alike. And I think it's because they are starting to realize that their similarities are far more than their differences and, and, and their, their desire for, um, you know, a job, a house, uh, be, being able to raise a family. They're realizing now that despite the fact that they have in some ways, my opinion, been try that people have tried to convince them they have more in common with people who just look like them rather than their economic situation or their educational background. And really, these young people, to me, seem to be realizing, no, that's not the case. I can, I, I'm a young white person in San Francisco who's having some of the same challenges as a, uh, a black person in a black young black kid in Detroit. And, you know, we can come together and make some changes that need to be made in order for us to have some successes as well. In terms of, of how we get more people engaged, it's, it's, it's easy to always talk within our group. If, if I am a conservative, I can talk with only people who wear the red uh, jersey. If I am a liberal, I can talk with only people who wear the blue jersey. Or I can talk with only people in, in my social class or people who I've known all my lives. How do we bridge those gaps because we really do have to talk about some uncomfortable but interesting topics. We have to develop, we have to use our innovation not to develop a new gadget, but we have to develop a new solution for our neighbors to make our city strong. How do we how do we do that without wasting time in, in meetings and convenings and, and uh, never ending blah blah, right, which you're all smiling because you've all been there, right? How do, you, how do we get from the point of dialogue to action really fast? Uh, Jamie, you want to give, a, give a, a, a cut at this one? Sure. I think I was just thinking about this, uh, this, this bringing us together from different corners of the United States, too, because I think it starts with this. It, should, it, is really, it feels very lonely sometimes running a not-for-profit not organization, and we're constantly in the front of advocacy and trying to bring in dollars and, and help people cross those lines. I, I think it's twofold. I am um, becoming more healthily frustrated with government than I've been in my career. And I'm starting to see that we have different parts of the government sector that need to really step up to, the, to answer this question for us. And I think the, it, our partners, they want to do it. They want to do well. And I, like you said, it's hundreds of meetings. 
we talk about it, we talk about it, and there's no action. I think right now with the pandemic, with you know the homeless crisis in California, there's up to 150,000 people living on the streets outside with the injustices happening right now, you know, it can't be a moment for us. And even in the last couple of months, I've had more uncomfortable dialogues and have, have really pushed myself in my um, capacity to do so. And so I do think we're, we have this new moment in front of us. We just have to ensure it's not just a moment. Um, I wanted to invite, uh, to invite our attendees to ask questions. Uh, if, if they have any, uh, we'll, we'll try and deal with them. Sharla, um, how are you seeing it? You're, you're an attorney. You've just taken uh, this, this, this role. How do you see engaging uh, members of your community who aren't normally attentive to these issues, but now it's just in front of us all? Yeah, I actually think Portia hit the nail on the head. I think it starts with young people. They're, they're much more open to, to, the, to new ideas and new dialogues. I think some of us old people are like, oh, it's, the idea of blowing up the system is kind of scary to us, right? But the young people, they're not afraid of it. And so I really think the dialogue starts there. And, and I, I tell you what, I have learned so much from listening to the younger people in our organization, really listening to what they're telling me, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. And I think, I think that's where, for me, the hope really lies. The hope really lies with the younger generation. Blowing up the system sounds so scary, but is it really? I mean, don't we as Americans blow up systems all the time? I mean, uh, Ford created Detroit, right? By blowing up the system, right? All of a sudden, we had these 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 noisy uh, uh, vehicles that we didn't have to feed uh, on on a regular basis and exercise, right? Instead of horses, we ended up with with the the horseless carriage, and and today we have um, uh, uh, Teslas uh, running around on on battery power. That's also blowing up the system. Apple blew up the system. We're aren't we as Americans people who periodically embrace the new and, and enjoy the ride? Maybe it's a conversation around, instead of using the word blowing up, maybe it is innovation, like you said earlier, like we need to innovate new ways in which we operate a criminal justice system or operate new way, innovate new ways in which we house people or feed people or train people or educate people. Um, I think maybe sometimes the idea of dismantling or blowing up is what's so scary to people is the, the, the images it conjures and really is really thinking about new ways and in innovation in ways we do these kind of things that we've been doing for so long and and really you know I always say to people there's really nothing we do anymore that we did the same way 50 years ago or even 30 years ago you know there's like absolutely nothing you do in your daily life that you did the same way 20 years ago right so I mean why should some of these same things these things around housing these issues around feeding making sure people are not food insecure making sure people have the appropriate education and training why should those still be the same way we've been doing it for 10 or 20 years we've got to think new and and one of the things that happened in the pandemic, to be very honest with you, is even for our organization, we had to pivot very quickly so we could continue our operations. We had to do it virtually and we had to do curbside and we had to do all these things we'd never really thought about, which was fantastic for myself and my staff because it, may, it forced us to think about how we're going to operate going forward and not just sticking to what we've done in the past. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that. We, I've noticed something. We, we have been involved in a collaboration with about six or seven other large nonprofits to provide rental assistance. And we're cross-referring and we've got a common application. And it's something that nonprofits have been trying to do for years. But it wasn't until this pandemic happened and the need became so great and we could meet virtually and we realized we could actually accomplish things in a Zoom meeting that these organizations all started coming together. And I'm gonna tell you, Mark, for me, I don't think you can work in the nonprofit world without being a, a hopeful person. You, you have to believe that you're making a difference. And so it's hard for me to look at any of these issues and, and have no hope. I, I always have hope. I always think it, it's going to get better. I always think things are going to change and we're going to change people's lives. And I just think that's inherent in working at a nonprofit. 
I was going to say the exact same thing, Charlotte. I think the beauty of the not-for-profit community-based organization is we know what needs to change. We prove time and time again how nimble and flexible we are to meet the needs. And I think that's where we are disruptors and where our public partners can't change on a dime. And so if we know the solutions, we innovate every day. Um, we know what our communities um, lack and need. It's how do we kind of, I think you started with it, Mark, how do we get more, um, more behind us and more power behind us from our communities so we can truly in innovate at a scale, at a scale where there is no national crisis of homelessness or poverty, those kinds of things. I also want to recognize something that is very obvious from anybody looking at this picture. We have three powerful women who in their own communities are creating change, right? A part of this is a matter of a, a male dominant society appreciating that the solutions are not necessarily in one gender's brain or one race's uh, sensibility or experience, um, it real or or one age group, um, or one language. Um, the the strength of America is this unity and diversity, right? And being able to share and being able to respect, not necessarily agree, but respect and then discuss and and find new solutions. Uh, we received a question about um, whether the uh, the academic uh, arena which is so rich in expertise and study and evidence-based analysis uh, might have a, a, um, a role in, in shaping change and in facilitating it. Um, have you all um, uh, interacted and collaborated with uh, universities and, and thought leaders in terms of shaping your own programs and, and determining your own strategies? We have in Detroit. I mean, one of the things I mentioned was academia and Wayne State University and our partnership with them and looking at this school to prison pipeline and how to dismantle that. But also, I think they play an active role in giving us information about where they see the future going. They pretty much have their finger on the pulse of where young people want to go, what they are interested in, what, um, you know, what they see as the future. And so we regularly tap into our partners in our university community around um, around Focus Hope to make sure that we are um, keeping abreast of where the next generation wants to go. I think that's really important when you talk about workforce training. I think particularly in Detroit, Focus Hope have been very manufacturing heavy because of the victory. And um, we're realizing very quickly that that is, not a, that is not sustainable for the future. That is not where we're gonna train 500 people to go into a plant because those jobs don't exist anymore, right? So we really have to work with the university community and academia to find out and kind of figure out along with employers, where's the future? Where's the future for the people that are coming to us? And so we'll wrap up with Sharla and then Jamie. Um, uh, Sharla, you want to uh, comment on, on that aspect of this, this whole idea of collaboration across different fields, including the academic field? Yes, so we're the same way because we do have the workforce development program. We are, we are working a lot with universities. And, um, I, you know, I think that ultimately it's going to have to be all industries, not just universities, not just nonprofits, but all of us coming together to really be able to solve these problems. And, and it is right now, it is a challenge with the pandemic because, because people are so worried about their immediate needs. And honestly, we're focusing on that. But, but long term, to come out of this, um, <clears throat> we're going to have to engage everyone in our community. And Jamie, you have the last word. Sure. I, I will say when crisis happens, and here before the pandemic, it was certainly the homeless crisis, we've had more public-private partnerships as an institution than ever before. One highlight, uh, Kaiser Permanente, they um, gave a record amount of uh, funds for us to house the senior population. Um, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. We have partnerships with hotels right now to house the homeless during the pandemic. So the collaboration, the, the really going deep um, across public-private partnerships, I think really is the way of the future. Well, thank you so much. This, this work will continue. 
um, for years to come, but it can be it can continue in a different way with um, additional constituents, with the help from our communities. Uh, Jamie Almansa of uh, the Bay Area Community Services, Charla Myers of uh, the Community Council of Dallas, and Portia Roberson uh, of uh, Focus Hope. Thank you so much for sharing the work that you're doing. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you all for attending and uh, come back uh, next Tuesday for the next uh, uh, session. This is, this is a wonderful dialogue. Thank you, thank you for, for sharing your work with us. Mm -hmm.